Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. This mic works. Okay. Could you all humor me for a second and take a moment to count the number of cameras you have on you right now? Remembering that your phones often have two, a front-facing and rear-facing camera, and don't forget about the one in your laptop. And if you're playing along at home, this is on YouTube, just maybe count those in arm's reach. Got it? Now count the number of pens and pencils you have on you. How many of you, a show of hands please, how many of you have more pens and pencils than cameras? How many of you have more cameras? There's a lot of cameras out there. So, 15 years ago, when I started watching my favorite soccer player, Francesco Tosi, he would sometimes celebrate an important goal by writing something on the shirt, showing it to the fans. A few weeks ago, he scored a very important goal against an inner city rival, and he did this. <laughs> Not only are cameras multiplying, but they become a primary tool of communication in the modern world. We use them to preserve our most important moments, to keep in touch with loved ones, to conference with our colleagues, to sell stuff, to guard stuff, to show off, to take political action, to remember minutia, and to make people laugh. Now the camera is nothing new. It's been around for ages, and in fact it can be reduced to nothing more than a black box with a pinhole. But I'd like to focus on a more recent milestone in this long history of the camera. I'd like to skip ahead to 1992, when Logitech, the technology company, gave us this little guy. The Photo Man! The Photo Man, the first mass market digital camera. Um, it was designed with a kind of kitschy look to harken back to the 60s and 70s robots and toy cameras. You can see it's kind of got a little button nose and the flash and the viewfinder kind of create these lopsided eyes almost as if it's winking or surprised at its own invention. Um, in 1992, $799 bought you resolution that looks like this. One megabyte of storage and some grayscale goodness. <laughs> the Logitech president said that the photo man, upon its release, represents uh, an advancement in humanizing the computer. And humanize it has. Think about these cameras. They're always on our bodies. They've become second cells, or at least second eyes. Right? I mean, sure, we Marshall McLuhan would say they're an extension of our vision. And, and sure, we, we dress them up from time to time with a photo filter or two, but we don't really think of these things as knowledge-making activities. This is natural to see. And this is where I'd like to make the difference. This is where I'd like us to say, let's hold on for a moment and step back and regard the amazing opportunities that the photo man and all his descendants have brought into our lives. Um, if, you, if you think, what has it brought in? You know, we, we, we look at our phones. Yes, these are, these are lovely. And their apps like Instagram and Vine are fun and time-saving. But I'm saying, hold on a bit, and I think it's time to take these things a little bit more seriously. I think it's time we tell them to get dressed, pack their lunches, and go to school. And this is what I mean. Remember all those things that the, the, the cameras do? You know, that they preserve the most important memories, help us communicate, conference with our colleagues, sell stuff, show off take action, remember things, take a joke, tell a joke. What did we use before we had cameras on us? We used 
this guy, the pen, the pencil. We wrote. We wrote diaries and letters and reminders and political screeds and satires. And before we had pens and pencils, what was the primary mode of com communication? What I'm doing right now. Speech, right? Speech. We told stories and we conversed and we boasted and bartered and we repeated and we told jokes. None of these things have died out. One doesn't replace the other. But the question is, how do we go about addressing these dominant forms of communication in our culture? With the Greeks, with the Greeks, when orality was in its heyday, we have treatises on rhetoric and speech making from people like Aristotle and Quintilian. And these became the foundation for what was called the paideia, the earliest school system, where children would go to become informed and empowered and engaged citizens. A thousand years later, the idea has flourished into the medieval university system. And in a, this great book on uh, this medieval scholar Peter Ramus, Walter Alm talks about how the primary mode of communication shifted from morality to the written alphabet. And if you look at some of the documents these early university students were producing, you see stuff like this. It's called the Porphyrian Tree. And you can see how it visually tried to organize knowledge and information. And communication becomes much more fixed and systematic. And I would say to you today that we're still very much in this tree. Writing continues to be the core of our idea. It, we see it as the key to unlocking all future types of learning. This is my first introduction into that world of writing. In fourth grade, I wrote Night of the Ninja. Um, and it was an epiphany for me, although I'm sure not for too many other people. Um, but I'm still indebted to Mrs. Kumpler and Mrs. Beer of Terre Haute, Indiana for, for encouraging me to do this and helping me. I fell in love with writing, and I still love writing today. But the question, the question remains, if we say that our cameras are starting to outnumber our pens, if it's as easy to send a paragraph or, or a picture as it is to send a paragraph, and if you can see that cameras are vital to exploring and expressing and taking action in today's modern world, then perhaps isn't it time maybe that we update this model of the idea, that we question this monopoly that writing has had in our school systems? It's been a good run. Thousand years, not too shabby. So what am I saying? I need to give every eight-year-old a DSLR now. And for the last few minutes here, I'd like to give you an example of how we might go about um, taking image making and making it a core competency or a foundational fluency in education. I'd like to talk to you about photo filters. You know, those one-touch operations that Instagram has popularized but they can be found in almost any camera app now. Yeah, photo filters essentially degrade an image in a creative way, applying an artistic effect, which harkens back to some vintage techniques of the dark room. Now, for help in doing this and cracking open these photo filters, which so often that we think, we think of these as automated, prepackaged templates, but I'd like to suggest that they can be touchstones for critical thinking and deliberate composition with the camera. And for help in doing this, I'm going to call upon the world's foremost lighting designer, Richard Kelly. Richard Kelly, I'm going to go through a lot of slides here, so this one, here we go. Richard Kelly. Richard Kelly was most prolific in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and he was the architect behind such designs, uh, design projects like, again, not the architect, but the lighting of the Seagram building in New York the Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil, and IBM World Headquarters. Kelly came up with a three-part system for thinking about the effects of light. The first type 
he called focal glow. Focal glow, in Kelly's words, is the campfire of all time. It is the light above your favorite reading chair, or the sun as it hits your back and casts a shadow on the grass below you. Focal glow is produced by a spotlight or a downlight. Focal glow calls attention to things. It sells things. It maximizes something's importance. Its logic is the logic of division. What is in light matters. What is not in light does not matter. Type one. Type two, ambient luminescence. Kelly describes ambient luminescence as the light of a snowy morning. It is an overcast sky, a twilight haze. Diffusion and the scattering of rays create ambient luminescence. He says, he says it suggests infinity and freedom. It's restful and reassuring. And it diminishes importance. Its logic, its logic is that of sameness. Everything gets the same light. Everything is equal. The third type of light is the play of brilliance. Kelly calls the play of brilliance Times Square at night. Candlelight in a chandelier, a diamond in a cave, or a light passing through stained glass on a stone floor. The play of brilliance works by refraction and reflection. It is the light of whimsy. It excites, Kelly says, it can either distract or entertain. Its logic is the logic of chance. It is an opportune angle, fortuitous timing. So let's take, as an example, uh, an application of this. Let's apply it to something. And I'd like to turn to the Bass Track Project. Um, the Bass Track Project was ran from 2010 to 2011. And it was conceived um, by some photojournalists like David German, Teru Koyama, and um, Balaz Gardi. What they did is they embedded themselves with Marines who were stationed in Afghanistan. And they documented their everyday lives, not with uh, professional photojournalist equipment, but with, but with camera phones. And specifically, they used the Hipstamatic app which is very similar to Instagram, except it, by default, applies these photo filters. And I'd like us to talk about how, how if we run Kelly through some of these photos, we can really start to kind of crack open some of the arts and practices and compositional possibilities in photo filters. Um, now, I encourage you to check out Base Track on Facebook. It's still running and updated. And some of the stories are very moving. But today, I'm, I'm just going to talk about um, these effects of Kelly's. Here's one photo. Let's talk about focal glow. So here, focal glow transforms this helicopter passing over uh, a former base into a prehistoric bird. It's backlit against the sun, casting the winds below into darkness. The sky is blue and vignettes again into darkness. Focal glow ensures that this background object comes to the foreground, and all who see it will regard it with awe. In this photo, a staff sergeant addresses his company and points to the horizon. You can see the contrast as the highlights that hit his body are, 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 are very distinguished against the shadows that surround his audience. Focal glow cuts him out of the surroundings and transforms him into almost a mythical figure like a, a statue or a die-cut action figure. It tells us that this is the man who needs to be listened to and reckoned with. And what about ambient luminescence? Kelly's second type of light. Remember, ambient luminescence does the opposite of focal glow. It downplays the difference, right? And increases similarity. That can be a very powerful rhetorical tool, tool especially when you're in a war-torn land. Here we have uh, a US serviceman patting down an Afghan civilian 
And you can see how ambient luminescence, in this case, a kind of wash of green is camouflaged in the camouflage. The uniform and the civilian clothes and the landscape are all dappled with green, bringing all these disparate parts together, and making the path down look not so bad. Again, in another photo, in a handshake, we see ambient luminescence peppers the sleeves and skin with mint and yellow and seals this contract in color. And again, when a detainee is being escorted down an alleyway, ambient luminescence in a desaturated, warm wash makes it look as almost as if they're out for a Sunday stroll. We hardly recognize the bindings around the man's wrists. But the effect that perhaps is best known in, um, in these photo filters is Kelly's third type of light, which is the play of brilliance. And in the base track photos, it's so often the faces of children that are caught in this contingent flash. They appear like specters, flaring into the foreground or hidden in the background. In this case, a child stands by a tree, and the sunlight beams down around him as troops advance with their rifles ready. The play of brilliance suggests that this child, or perhaps even childhood itself, is a fleeting moment, a rare sighting in this land overrun with adults and guns. Now, this is just one example. This is, this is Kelly and photo filters are just one way of talking about the opportunities that cameras are ushering in, into our lives, the way that cameras are structuring our situation, and the way we communicate it. There's so much to do. There's so many opportunities when we stop thinking about cameras as either a pastime or an extension of our vision and start recognizing them as a portal into another way of seeing. What, what an amazing fluency to teach to a child. A way of seeing how images shape knowledge. A way of seeing how light influences the messages that we compose. Think of all that we might discover if we were invited to reflect as much with our cameras as with our pens. Thank you.